Bibles to Proverbs chapter 15. wisdom of God, we read, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouths of fools pour out folly. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. A fool despises his father's instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is prudent. In the house of the righteous there is much treasure, but trouble befalls the income of the wicked. The lips of the wise spread knowledge, not so the hearts of fools. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable to him. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he loves him who pursues righteousness. There is severe discipline for him who forsakes the way. Whoever hates reproof will die. Sheol and Abaddon lie open before the Lord. How much more the hearts of the children of men. A scoffer does not like to be reproved. He will not go to the wise. A glad heart makes a cheerful face. But by sorrow of heart, the spirit is crushed. The heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge, but the mouths of fools feed on folly. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but the cheerful of heart has a continual feast. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. The way of a sluggard is like a hedge of thorns, but the path of the upright is a level highway. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish man despises his mother. Folly is a joy to him who lacks sense, but a man of understanding walks straight ahead. Without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors they succeed. To make an apt answer is a joy to a man, and a word in season, how good it is. The path of life leads upward for the prudent, that he may turn away from Sheol beneath. The Lord tears down the house of the proud, but maintains the widow's boundaries. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but gracious words are pure. Whoever is greedy for unjust gain troubles his own house, but he who hates bribes will live. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. The Lord is far from the wicked, But he hears the prayer of the righteous. The light of the eyes rejoices the heart, and good news refreshes the bones. The ear that listens to life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. Whoever ignores instruction despises himself, but he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. The fear of the Lord is instruction and wisdom, and humility comes before honor. Thus far, our Old Testament lesson, please turn now to the letter to the Ephesians by Paul, chapter 5, beginning with verse 15. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, 
addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Let's pray together. God, our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity that you give to us as your word calls out to us, asking that we might assemble before you. And we are here now, and we're waiting upon you. You have the words of eternal life. And we pray that you would make your word plain to us now. Lord, open our eyes that we would behold Christ, our ears that we might hear him speaking to our hearts. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Ever since I can remember, I've had a sweet tooth as long as my leg. And the cafeteria at Michigan State University gave me an excellent opportunity to indulge myself. Now, thankfully, my metabolism at that time kept me skinny as a rail. And I was happy for those four years at Michigan State. There was no limit on serving sizes, and my sweet tooth really began to grow. More recently, however, it has begun to affect both my waistline and my sugar levels. Now, a friend gave me a blood glucose meter to help me to measure my sugar. He also urged me to exercise. Walking is a simple and effective exercise. It's also rather inexpensive. And so I thought I was all set, except that I wasn't. Merely taking regular blood glucose readings every morning or every other morning does not in itself lower your sugar levels. Knowing that walking is helpful and a good form of exercise is of no help if I don't take the time to go walking and stop making excuses about why I'm not walking. I need to be more deliberate, more intentional if I'm going to get a handle on my sugar and if I want to genuinely be healthy. Now the same principles are true in the church. Just because a group of people have organized themselves as a church doesn't make it a healthy church. Just because people show up on Sunday morning does not make this a healthy church. Health does not just happen. It must be carefully cultivated, it must be intentional and deliberately pursued. And that's what the concern of the apostle is in our text in Ephesians this morning. The apostle Paul was in prison for his faith. 
and he was concerned for the future welfare of churches that he had planted throughout Asia and indeed throughout the world. And so he wrote this letter to express his concern to the churches about them as churches. He wanted to remind them of what it means to be a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then to urge them to become in practice what they were committed to in theory. Chapters 1 to 3 set forth a theological basis for the church. What does it mean to be a church? And then beginning in chapter 4 through the end in chapter 6, he fleshes out what all that means for the life and existence of the church. The pivot point comes in chapter 4, verse 1, where having spoken of the theological foundation of the church, he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. To walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And by walk, he means the manner of living. That was the way people would speak about the way of life. How, how is your walk? And we sometimes use the word walk in that way. Sometimes someone might ask you, how's your Christian walk? Asking about your spiritual welfare. But what Paul was saying here is that this is how you are to live as a church. If you are going to live worthy of the calling that you have received. This is how you are to be the church. That's his concern in the second half of this letter. Indeed, seizing on that word walk urging us to be worthy of the calling and walk in a manner consistent with that calling, he refers four more times to how the church was to walk. In chapter 4, verse 17, he says, Walk not as the Gentiles do in the immorality and ungodliness, but be holy. In chapter 5, verse 2, he says, walk in love as Christ loved us. In chapter 5, verse 8, he says, walk as children of light. And then going on to distinguish darkness from light. And then finally, here in our text, in verse 15, his last use of the word walk. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Paul's concern for the church, in, in a sense, is being wrapped up in this, in this text. He will go on to apply what he says here to the different relationships that obtain in the church and then speak of the spiritual battle that confronts us as a church. But here he is, in a sense, bringing together how we are to be the church. How are we to live as the people of God? And he urges us to live wisely. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Paul's concern is that we who are the church will assume that we will be the church because we are the church and not give much thought to it. Church health does not just simply happen, as I've already noted. It requires informed intentionality. That's what he says. Look carefully. 
Look carefully. Scrutinize what's going on. What's happening? How are you living? Look carefully how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. It's possible to walk unwisely. But he doesn't want us to go that way. He wants us to be wise in the way that we walk as the people of God. You see, the church is not just one of many social organizations to which people can belong and join. As the people of God, we have a unique identity. It's not just that we belong to the church, like we belong to uh, the Lions Club. We uh, belong to this political party. We have a membership in, in the YMCA or some other social organization. No, it's not that we belong to the church. We do. It can be said we belong to the church, but we are the church. God has called us out. We have a unique calling. We've been given a new identity in Christ. The question is, how are we to pursue that identity and make it our own? How do we walk wisely as the people of God? Through a series of three positive, negative contrasts, Paul points us to the path for church health. How do we walk wisely as the people of God? We first anticipate opportunities for God's service. We understand well God's will for us. And we are filled with God's spirit. First, we are to anticipate opportunities for God's service. He says in verse 16, making the best use of the time. Making the best use of the time. The New International Version says, making the most of every opportunity. Now, in Greek, there are two different words for time. Time is something that passes. Time is something to be measured, is the Greek word chronos. But there's another word speaking of a, a period of time, a special moment in time. That's the Greek word kairos, and that's what is used here. And that's why we can speak of it as being making the most of every opportunity. Rather than simply existing as a church by passing through time, we are to be alert and anticipate the kairos, the special opportunity, the opportunities that God gives to us for service. We're not just to coast along closing our eyes and enjoying the breeze. No, rather, we are to be searching. We are to look carefully. We are to take the opportunities that are given to us. I would imagine that many of you have had the experience where you had an opportunity to speak of Christ and you let it pass. It might have just gone by so quickly you didn't recognize it. And then you sort of kick yourself afterwards uh, saying, why didn't I do this? Why, why didn't I say something? 
John Stott wrote a little book, Our Guilty Silence, about how easy it is to miss opportunities. But as the church, we're to make the most of every opportunity. The Apostle Peter spoke in this regard in 1 Peter 3.15. He says, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Always be prepared. Make the most of every opportunity. To make the most of the opportunity, you need to see the opportunities that are there, which means we need to be looking for opportunities. Rather than just getting up in the morning and blindly stumbling about our day, we need to ask God, Lord, what do you have for me today? What are the opportunities that are there for me personally? What opportunities are there for us as a church? Now, we regularly have uh, taken a, a, a collection in the month of November for the Union Rescue Mission for Christmas baskets. And um, because of COVID and all the federal money that's been floating around and, and so on, they're deluged with food down at the rescue mission. So this year, they're asking us more for coats and hats and items, but when they would put the food baskets together, I guess they're going to make these items available as well, then it used to be that they would have everybody go down to the rescue mission on a Saturday morning and you just, all sorts of people are building these boxes and then other people are taking them out. Well, this year they've decided to do it differently. and. Blair was down there one day and he heard that they're going this year to uh, set up distribution centers throughout the county where people can come and pick up their uh, 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 boxes and so people aren't having to take them and going into people's homes and, and so Blair s immediately says sign up our church. So on December 17th at noon, they're going to deliver 30 or 40 boxes for the LaVale community, and people are going to be told to come to Faith Presbyterian Church. And we'll have the opportunity to greet them as they come. We can give them a box. Perhaps we can include a piece of literature or just engage them with friendly conversation. But we'll meet some of our neighbors and even perhaps some of the neighbors that we've never met before and would not meet in any other way. Blair seized an opportunity. He, he took it right away. And we can do, we need to be alert for opportunities as a church and we need to be alert and looking, expecting that God will use us as a church. Now, Rather than, as too often can happen, seeing people as obstacles to our daily life, we run into people and we have other things on our mind to do, we need to see the people that God brings in front of us as opportunities rather than obstacles. It requires that we look carefully as we walk along, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of the opportunities because the days are evil. And, and that's the reality. In, in the biblical worldview, there were two ages, the current age, which is an evil age, where sin reigns, and the age to come. And so he's saying the days are evil. It's easy to be distracted. It's, there's a lot of wickedness around us. And so we need to be intentional because otherwise we'll just get dragged by all the chaos going on around us and lose sight of our calling as a church. Life is hard and the hardness of life can blind us to what God is doing in us personally and as a church. Neil Postman a number of years ago, wrote a book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, 
talking about how we distract ourselves with entertainment. And I think this was before the day of the smartphone, but just, you know, we, you go to the mall or you walk down the street and, and you see a group of people walking and they're together, but they're not together. They're connecting online. Apparently, sometimes they're connecting to one another online, but rather than engaging one another, they're just engaging with the entertainment. And it's easy to um, be distracted by that. There's all these interesting things. I mean, a world of information is now right in front of your face, but could it be that we're connecting with social media, but not connecting with any people? And God wants us, as his church, to connect with people. And so we need to anticipate opportunities for God's service. Make the best use of the time that God has given us. None of us knows how long we have to live. And um, thankfully, our congregation has been largely spared from the COVID uh, virus, but many places have been devastated by it. And people that were healthy one day are gone the next. Well, that can happen to churches, too. They're here one day, and suddenly, boom, they're not there anymore. They just dissolve. They disappear. Because people were comfortable just floating along. They did not make the best use of the opportunities. And that's what he wants us to do, is to anticipate opportunities for God's service. Along with that, at the same time, through another contrast, he says, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, previously in chapter 4, he had made clear what the will of the Lord is, and that is don't live like the Gentiles. Put off the old, be renewed, and put on the new. That's what God's will is. He, he's made us, the church, to be a new people. But the people of God continually forget that that's what God is doing. Abraham was told that he was made to be a blessing to the nation. But Israel very quickly just turned in on itself and saw itself over against the nations when they were supposed to be the blessing to the nations. And then they pursued the other nations instead of their own God, and God let them be taken away by the other nations. When he says, understand what the will is rather than being a fool, and in our brief one chapter of Proverbs, it made several references to the fool. The fool is the one who wants nothing to do with God, who doesn't want to listen to God, who doesn't want to engage with God, who thinks they are self-sufficient to themselves. And he says, no, don't be foolish. Don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And by understand, he is speaking about more than merely intellectually being able to recite something, but actually personally appropriating it, practically implementing it, if we really understand the will of the Lord, then we will do the will of the Lord. If we say that we believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God, but don't read it and don't put it into practice, that really doesn't mean very much. But he says you want to understand what God's will. If you're being looking for opportunities for service, you need to understand what God's will is so that you can actually serve him. 
so that in the midst of the opportunities that are before you, that you can go forward and actually serve the Lord because we understand what his will is, what his purposes are. Now, we may not understand completely his purpose for a given opportunity that he presents to us, but if we understand his scriptural revelation, it will give us a general background so that as we engage with people, we can discern what is God doing in this and how can I help this person? And how, how can we best present the Lord to this person. There's a variety of ways to present Christ to people. We see this in the life of Jesus himself. The way he spoke to the woman at the well in Samaria in John 4 is very different than the way he spoke to the rich young ruler. He said to the woman, go get your husband the rich young ruler, he said, well, go keep the commandments. Oh, sell everything. He, he said he kept the commandments. He said, okay, now sell everything and give to the poor, which immediately identified that the 10th commandment was not in his list when he said he kept them all. But he was speaking to each person's need, but he, he could speak to each person's need because he understood as the Son of God, God's love for the people. And as we come to know Christ and understand his love for people, we can better respond to the opportunities that are there because we do understand his love and compassion, his heart. We need to anticipate opportunities to serve him we need to be focused intentionally. We, in order to do, fulfill those opportunities, we need to understand God's will. We just don't want to fly by the seat of our pants. But rather, we want to know how can we truly help people? How can we truly help people? And finally, he says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Interesting thing he says here, and do not be drunk with wine. There's uncertainty about why he suddenly bring, brings in drunkenness, though throughout the scripture, Old and New Testament, drunkenness is identified as not a good thing. Some people think that he is drawing an analogy to the religion of Dionysius in and around Ephesus where the idea was is you just get drunk, uh, you get yourself all stirred up in drunkenness and supposedly the God will reveal himself to you in the midst of your drunken state. Others think that he's just, it's a common thing for the unbelievers, those who have no regard for God, to get drunk in one form or fashion or another, whether trying to drown their sorrows or to escape the problems of life. Of course, nowadays we have more than alcohol to do that. We have the opioids and all sorts of drugs that can take away the pain of, of living in a harsh world. But he's making an, a contrast with being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I, I think his, it seems that the point he's making in this, are you going to be in, come under the influence of some agent, in a sense, outside yourself, alcohol, or are you going to be under the influence of one within you that is the Holy Spirit? 
people get a ticket for DUI, driving under the influence. He is suggesting instead that we be UIS, under the influence of the Spirit. Or perhaps even more accurately, under UIG, under the influence of God. Because when you look at the letter to the Ephesians, the word filling occurs in a number of places and it has reference to both Jesus and God in the prayer of Ephesians 1. Um, we read in verse 23 that the church is Christ's body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. In chapter 3, we're told through Paul's prayer as he asked that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. And now he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now it, it may be better translated, be filled by the Spirit. It's not so much that the Spirit is uh, some content that's within us, but rather the influence of God. But as we look at that command, even the command itself is instructive in a number of ways. First of all, it is an imperative, be filled, which means that we need to take it seriously. This is something we, as the church, and we as individuals need to take serious. We are to be filled. This is God's will for us. But secondly, it's plural. It is a plural command. So it's not just something about me, myself, and I. It's something about us together. He is speaking to the church and he's saying, y'all be filled. As a church, it's not just enough to have one or two people filled with the Spirit, but we're expected to be all filled. He's speaking to us as his people. It's also interesting in that it is a passive verb. Be filled. A passive verb. Which means that there's a sense in which you can't do anything. It's not a technique that you need to master. It's something that has to happen to you from outside, that God himself has to do this. We need to make ourselves open to him. It's interesting in the letter to the Colossians, which was uh, written at the same time period and has a lot of parallels in Colossians 3 verse 16 he says let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom singing psalms hymns and spiritual songs very similar to what we read in our text except instead of be filled with the spirit let the word of Christ dwell in you richly there is a close relationship between the Word of Christ and the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit and the Word work together, not at odds with one another, not independently of one another, but most of the time together with one another. It's also a present imperative, which is significant in that in Greek, a present imperative conveys a sense of continuously happening, continuously do this, continuously be filled with the Spirit. It's not something we do once and now we've done our duty and it's done, but it's something if we're going to be, if we're going to walk wisely as the people of God, we need to be filled with the Spirit continually. 
We need God's presence in our lives as his people if we are to be his people, if the world is to recognize that we are his people. Now, how do we know whether or not we're filled with the Spirit? Well, he immediately gives us five participles telling us what that looks like. He says, first, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So in other words, that we're filled with the Spirit when we come together as God's people. And when we come together, when we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. But he says we're addressing one another. One of the functions of our gathering for worship and in singing Psalms is not just to give praise to God, but it's to remind one another and to instruct one another in the truths that we need to know, we need to understand what God's will is. But God's people, when they're filled by God's Spirit, are going to be together encouraging one another with the Word. Fellowship is not just having food together, it's sharing Christ together with one another. And in our fellowship, you see, we become the church. That fellowship is important, that we're together and we're communicating God's word, whether it be through psalm or song or hymn. And people try to distinguish between those words. There's a lot of overlap. Some say it's important to distinguish and others say it's just a comprehensive way of referring to all ways of communication. We need to be addressing to one another. And then he, the next two participles that show that we're filled with the Spirit, he says, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. That aspect of worship that is directed to God, but directed to God from the heart, sincerely. Not merely showing up and singing the words that are on the screen or in the hymnal because they're there, but that they are actually coming from you because you have embraced those words and internalized those words and made them your own, and you want them to be offered to God. Only when the Spirit is working within us, will our dull and dead hearts actually want to offer praise to God? And then the fourth uh, participle, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not merely the adoration, but the giving thanks acknowledging that we're dependent on him, that what we are and who we are is not because we have figured it out on our own and worked it out for ourselves, but it's because he has given it to us. That's what, that's what giving thanks means. And he says, giving thanks always and for everything. It doesn't mean that we thank God for evil. Oh, Lord, I'm, I'm glad that my friend died of cancer. But what we can thank God for is that in the midst of all the chaos around us, that he is still God and that he causes all things to work together for good. And so we can thank him for all these things, not because they're good, but because we know that he is the Lord and in control. But it's as we're full of the Spirit that we give thanks to God the Father. We remember that he is our Father, that he does care for us. But we do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The whole Trinity comes to bear, you see, as the Spirit indwells us and as Christ is present within us by the Spirit and as our hearts are directed to the Lord. And 
And then the final preposition, or participle, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's interesting how he builds this, explaining what it means to be filled by the Spirit. First, there is the horizontal level, encouraging one another with the truth. Then there's the vertical of giving praise, singing and making melody to the Lord with our hearts. Then there is the humility on the vertical level, giving thanks to the Lord for what he's done. And then there's the humility on the horizontal level, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. We don't need to lord it over one another. But when Christ is truly present, when the Spirit is within us, we don't have to make ourselves better than anyone. Indeed, we can submit to one another and serve one another because we're not threatened by one another because the Lord is with us. And this is how the world, you see, sees that God is in us. As we express our love for one another and our love for God, the two great commandments, to be filled with the Spirit is to be people who encourage one another and are humble before one another, who praise God and who thank God. That's what it means to live intentionally as the people of God. We do assemble, we do come together because we know we need to. I need you. You need me. I need to hear your voices singing the hymns when I don't feel like singing. And maybe you don't feel like singing all the time either, but, but you need to hear us singing because you need to be reminded of the truths that are there. And by our mutual encouragement together when we gather, we also need to help direct one another up towards God. Living the Christian life alone is not really an option for us. But we're called to live as his people. We're called to live intentionally, wisely. It's as we sing the gospel and pray the gospel together that not only does the gospel go out to others but the gospel comes back to us and as our fellowship and our worship becomes infused by the spirit of God and with the gospel of God that's how other people then will see that the church is not just another social organization. That something greater than a group of individuals is here. That God himself has come to his people and indwelt them. And he rides upon their praises. And as they see the care that we have for one another, the adoration that we have for the Lord, we then show ourselves to be the people of God that he has chosen for himself and that he has sent out into the world that the world might yet through them see God. May we be that kind of a people, not just assuming church is gonna happen, not just assuming ministry is going to happen. Not just rolling along because this is what we've always done. But rather by God's grace, encouraging one another, learning from one another, submitting to one another, building one another up, together offering praise to God, together thanking him and recognizing that we are not our own saviors, but God himself has saved us. 
May we find joy in the Lord as we walk wisely with a forethought, looking for ways that God can use us in one another's lives and in the lives of people around us and in our community and in being the people of God. We bring honor to our Lord but also salvation to people who desperately need him. Let's pray.